ask, is it okay? It's being recorded. Cool. Um, all right. <laughs> that's what I was waiting it. for. That's what I was waiting for. All right. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to advocacy to the 2024 advocacy days, um, and welcome to uh, uh, it's officially session um, is in full um, full gear. Um, we are gonna we have a couple of representatives here with us today. We're gonna have Representative Farvar and we have Representative Taylor here as we speak. And just be sure as you're hopping on to uh, uh, select your language on the globe icon, um, share what district you're from, organization, put your name and uh, just respect one another as, as their speakers hopping on and stay muted um, when they're speaking and, uh, and you know, just be mindful and respect one another. And um, so, yeah, um, um, and for those of us who don't know, uh, haven't met us, um, I'm Taylor Crisp. I am co-hosting um, Advocacy Days along with uh, uh, my other co-host uh, that we're glad to have back, um, Tanika. And, uh, and we're going to go get started. And uh, we're going to start by letting uh, Representative uh, Taylor speak. Uh, um, so whenever you're ready, um, um, Rep. Taylor, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I am so honored to be here to chat with you on the first of several uh, uh advocacy days, um, my excitement to be in Olympia and to see the work that we are constantly doing in interim and beyond come to life and gain the support that we've not seen in years past. My name is Representative Jamila Taylor out of the 30th District, um, and that is in South King County, centered around Federal Way, parts of Auburn, parts of Des Moines, parts of uh, unincorporated King County, Algona, and Pacific. And I am just in awe of the advocacy that you all are doing every day, day in and out, sometimes just helping people understand what your life is all about um, and that folks just make a lot of assumptions. When I came into office, I did not realize how much of Washington State was an ableist community. Um, I am a person who has a brother with developmental disabilities, and uh, and and he is my twin. So you know we're in our forties, trying to live our best lives. And I also uh, live with my mother, who um, they both have chronic ongoing illnesses. So it's not just about a person with uh, disabilities, but it's about how life you know, throws a lot of hiccups at us every single day. Thinking about our families who are in our community that are looking at housing challenges. You know, am I gonna have medication or am I gonna pay the light bill this week? Or am I gonna have um, uh, food to eat or am I gonna have, be, have enough money to pay rent because my landlord wants to raise it 300,000%. Um, in, in the work that I'm doing here, I have been um, invited to lead the Developmental Disability Advocacy Caucus. It is a bipartisan, meaning both Republicans and Democrats, um, and bicameral, meaning that we have both House members and Senate members. So we are covering the corners of the legislative process in terms of helping our colleagues understand how we can do better by folks who are impacted by developmental disabilities. And this year, we've prioritized four bucket areas. Number one, housing. And if you know anything about my, my colleague, Representative Chop, he is relentless in terms of his advocacy for expanded housing for communities just like ours. Also, workforce. Workforce is something that's challenging folks who um, might need day services, might need uh, coordinated care, might need behavioral health supports. We don't have enough of the right people in the right places across the state. So how can we address our workforce shortages in all parts of industries that impact individuals with developmental disabilities and their families? You are with us in this fight till the end of time. Special education is a huge, huge, huge bucket that is mm, complicated, but I, 
I know that with your advocacy, we are going to simplify it so that our legislators make the right decision, not just for the students who are in school today, but the future students in school who will eventually need the help um, in our school district. And finally, our, our main bucket is access to services. And this is what I'm calling disability justice. It, what's the point of having a waiver if there are no service providers? What's the point of a, a waiver if we don't tell people that um, services are even available? What is the point of all these um, resources if we are screened out of them by arbitrary means? And so we've been working through opportunities to expand options and opportunities for our community. So when you see our bills uh, come out, um, there will be a series of bills that we support in the Developmental Disability Advocacy Caucus. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the whole of the bills that impact the developmental disability community. Um, it's the ones that we're honing in on because we need to have specific focus. These, are, these might be more controversial even if we have a lot of support from sponsors. So for example, uh, thinking about parents as paid caregivers for their children. We have 20 sponsors on that, bipartisan. Um, when we're looking at the ESIT program, we have 22 sponsors, bipartisan. When we're talking about day hab services, we have um, 24 sponsors on the house side. Um, and then thinking about how we get these bills, not just from introduction, but all the way to the governor's office and then implemented in our communities. This is the beginning of the fight. This is the middle of the challenge. And I know that you're going to stick with us and help us understand how all, all of these policies impact your everyday lives. I know that we're not the only state going through some of these challenges. And so we're going to take a lot of what we're learning here and bring na nationwide advocacy. One of my goals, I'm going to say it out loud, I'm going to speak it into existence, is that we will have a a national policy conference on developmental disability advocacy hosted right here in the state of Washington, where you all are leading the way. Because I know that there are colleagues like me in other states who just don't have the kind of community support, support and mobilization that I've been, been inspired by in your work here in Washington state. So I wanna bring this energy all the way up to the federal level and to ensure other states are um, you know, catching up to where we're moving in our advocacy in Washington state. We're not at the top of the list on, on many situations in developmental advocacy, the devel um, devel <laughs> devel disability developmental advocacy. Um, and we that doesn't stop us from going hard in the pain and really moving forward um, to, to improve everyday lives, your lives, my life, and all, all those who are impacted by these common issues. I welcome you to reach out as you go along in your disability advocacy days and know that um, in my work here in the legislature, I am hoping to bring even more of my lawmakers uh, together and ensuring that we are prioritizing this justice for our communities. And thank you. And I'm so looking forward to the ongoing collaboration. Thank you, Representative Taylor. What a great way to kick off our advocacy days. Thank you for getting us fired up this morning. Again, everybody, thank you so much for being here with us for advocacy days. I am Tanika Aiden. I am your other co-host here. For those of you who need a visual descriptor of me, I am an African-American woman. Uh, I'm still youngish. I have big curly hair. I'm wearing <laughs> earrings and a plaid shirt today. Um, so thank you so much for, for being here with us. Um, we are going to go ahead and I can only see me. So if anyone has their hands up or if there's anything in the chat, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I see we have a, a question. Is it Ella Fair? Okay, Ella Fair, go ahead. Did you want to ask a question real quick? And you're on mute there. Okay, hello everyone. Um, greetings, and I'm glad to be here. I enjoyed Representative Taylor's um, outlining of the four points. I missed the fourth point. Uh, I have housing, sped access to services, and what was the fourth priority? 
I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Awesome. Again, thank you. Thank you, Representative Taylor. And now I'm going to pass it off to Kathy Mirahashi, and she's going to give us an overview of our topics. I'm going to, we're going to wait because um, I think um, Representative Faravar is here. Oh, and we're going to let her right. go first because she's got, we've got to get her going to her next our committee meeting. So, all right. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I appreciate your flexibility. We've got to get to the floor and uh, continue passing some really good bills. Um, really, really excited to be with you all. My name is Daria Faravar. I see a lot of familiar faces, and that's one of my um, uh, reasons why I absolutely love to come back to this community. As many of you know, this is the community that really invested in me and trusted in me to um, take on some of this advocacy work in the legislature, starting at Open Doors for Multicultural Families and moving on to Disability Rights Washington. It is so good to be back and be in community with you all. Uh, I uh, feel very grateful that I get to prime sponsor the Nothing About Us Without Us Act. This is something that I had the privilege of working with many of you on, including Ivanova Smith, which I'm sure is around on the Zoom meeting somewhere. Um, while I was an advocate at Disability Rights Washington. This is a really simple and very, very, very important concept. If we as the legislature are going to um, work on these big systemic challenges, we need to have the folks that are directly impacted by them at the table. It's that simple. This legislation uh, actually puts some accountability behind that and requires that when we're putting together um, specific work groups and task forces that um, have been developed in order to create recommendations for the legislature to consider options on moving forward, that you have to have people with lived experience there, um, and specifically three people with direct lived experience. So um, this is, I believe, our third year running this bill. This last session, we were able to make it all the way over to Senate Ways and Means, um, where we ran into some challenges, and I believe there was a little bit of confusion on their part. So I have been spending uh, my interim making my rounds with all the Ways and Means members. I think there's just like two more left on my list to meet with, um, as well as the state agencies, and really trying to understand um, what went into the fiscal notes. Now, um, the fiscal notes for, for these agencies were really focused on kind of future speculation about what potential future work groups might exist that might incur costs, right? Uh, to me, that indicates that the cost should be indeterminate. So I've had some great conversations with um, agencies who uh, I'm optimistic are going to take a more critical look at this legislation, their fiscal notes, and give us maybe some different results this year. I've also spent some time meeting with Ways and Means member just to reintroduce the bill to them and address their concerns. And I, I think we've done a really good job of trying to meet them where they're at so far. Now, the trick is to keep the pressure on. Um, session has started and this is a bill that's still in rules. What I'm hoping to do um, is roll this bill back from third reading onto second reading, which means we're able to actually amend it take out some language that's no longer needed because we were able to make some progress last year and we had um, the role of the Office of Equity fully funded at $200,000. So they are off to the races trying to do some community engagement and build a toolkit to support state agencies in this work moving forward. Um, so we need to go back and make some clarifying and technical changes as well as re-emphasize that, again, this is work that should already be happening so we're adding language into this bill that says that it needs to happen within existing resources. So I'm optimistic that we'll have an easier time uh, with Ways and Means this year. But that being said, would love to have any and all of you reach out to your senators on Ways and Means or otherwise, as we need to make sure everyone really understands how important this bill is, not just for the DD community, who of course sparked this idea and brought this legislation forward, but for all communities that have not been represented and not been heard in the legislative process. This is a fundamental cultural shift for the legislature. I know many of my colleagues work very hard to include folks with direct lived experience, and some might not have the understanding of how to do that or might leave folks out unintentionally. We can't have that anymore. We have been asking the legislature for years, if not decades, to come to the table and, and let our voices be heard on these issues, again, that are directly impacting us. 
through this time that we had some some muscle behind that and we really held ourselves accountable to this. So I'm grateful to uh, work with you all in this and be partners together. And I look forward to getting us out of ways and means and onto the Senate floor this year. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much, Representative Farnvar. And I know that you said you were working closely with Ivanova. Is Ivanova here? Did you want to have a few words about nothing you. about us? Oh, there you are. All right. This is Ivanova Smith. And I am really passionate about this bill because historically, for a lot of our civil rights movement, one thing that um we know is people have been harmed by policy that were made without them. When we don't respect nothing about us without us, we end up hurting the people with our policy. And so this legislation, it's really about changing that cycle, not just saying we're wanting to change things and fight for equality and justice, but this is a way that we can implement that and make sure that people with direct lived experience with an issue have say in how that issue is resolved. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we were at the forefront of this legislation, but we wanted to make sure that it included all communities that have been harmed by policies that were made without their representation. And so by broadening this bill, we hope that we will build a strong coalition of community members that will benefit from being able to be at the table when new policies and decisions are being made. So that if a farmer is, if, if there's disputes about farmland, that the farmers will get to be involved. If there are disputes about water rights in Yakima, that the tribes in Yakima would get a say in that. This is about making sure that communities that have been directly impacted will get to be involved in future legislation. So please support Representative Farvar and I in getting this bill passed. Uh, please speak to your senators. A lot of them uh, still have questions about this bill, uh, may not know about the benefits of this bill. It doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. This bill will benefit all communities, local, city, urban, uh, su 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 um, suburb, all communities, I hope, would benefit from this bill and that we will finally have no policy without representation. Thank you so much and support 1541, nothing about us without us. Thank you both Ivanova and Representative Faravar for that and just to, just to con and thank you for just continuing that ongoing uh, support for um, for and helping us re and help just keeping that momentum going and knowing that it's just still crucial to make sure we're included in our community. Um, and up next, we're going to have Kathy kind of Murahashi um, speak and kind of go over kind of the topic for today. Bye Farver. Oops. Good morning and welcome again to Advocacy Day. I'm Kathy Murahashi. I am the, um, and what am I? Public <laughs> Policy Specialist at the Ark of Washington. Can you tell that I've got a brand new job? Um, I'm so glad you're here. Um, today's topic is about civil rights. And the question is, what are your rights and how do we advocate? And we just got to hear some great stuff from, thank you so much, Representative Taylor and Representative Farivar for being with us. And Ivanova, you rock it. <laughs> yeah. Because really that bill is about civil rights, that you have a voice in this process and that everybody should have a vo voice there. So, you know, some of the things Framing this topic is thinking about, you know, people with 
disabilities, they want to live everyday ordinary lives. They want to live, they want jobs, you want to learn in the community and you want to have play, right? Everyday ordinary lives. And, you know, sometimes we need some accommodations to make that happen so that you get the support you need to have those things happen. Our federal law says that are there to make sure that you're not denied services, that you're not treated unequally, um, that you're not relegated to segregated settings, and that to make sure that you have an equal opportunity to benefit from all the services that we have, right? I think that's what everybody wants is that to have those everyday ordinary lives. But because we need the legislators to support those things and we have to work hard to make those things happen because there's a lot of things that block us and, and make it so we don't get that, right? Um, so um, we need to make sure that our programs are designed to work for us so that they, they're not just a bunch of barriers, that they, they, they work well for us. And we mean to make sure that the, our budget, the state budget reflects the cost of the, making our services accessible to us. Um, today, we're gonna hear about a couple of bills that are directly related to civil rights. And we have some speakers that are going to be here to talk about those things. Um, and then we'll hear more about some of the bills, sp specifically about the bills and so forth that are coming. So that's just a little, that's just in, things in a nutshell for today. All right. Thank you, Kathy, for the overview of our topic. And I looked it up. She is our new public policy specialist for the ARC. <laughs> so she is here. Um, our, our, our beloved Diana is retiring, so she is transitioning over. She can never take her place, of course, but she will be here to support us mm -hmm. in uh, leading this journey. So thank you so much, Kathy, again. So we are now gonna transition over and hear about legal aid from Stephanie Sherman Peterson from the Ark of Spokane. Stephanie, are you here? I am here. Can you hear oh, me right. okay? You're good. Great, okay. Um, so I just wanted to start with um, thanking Kathy and um, Tanika and Taylor for hosting again, as always doing a great job um, and welcome Kathy. I'm Stephanie Sherman Peterson. I'm from the Ark of Spokane, and um, I'm going to be doing my best to follow those amazing speeches that just went. Um, but I really want to um, start off today by talking a little bit about our legal services pilot program um, that that was studied here in Spokane. People with IDD and their families face significant obstacles when seeking um, access to civil legal services. They Challenges including um, lack of knowledge about where to turn for help, complicated intake processes like phone trees and long holding times, um, an inability to take action on brief service or trainings, a lack of understanding about when a problem actually has a legal remedy. Um, so here in Spokane, uh, the Arca Spokane commissioned a legal feasibility study. It's now entitled uh, Nowhere to Turn, and this study revealed that across Washington, people with IDD face legal challenges with regularity, issues like guardianship, special education, employment, housing, medical, government benefits, so many. Um, and yet systems are not set up to support them to access legal representation. We want people with IDD to have um, a place to turn. Um, they're experiencing legal barriers to accessing services and supports, impacting their ability to fully live their lives. Um, and I'm going to put the Nowhere to Turn study in the chat when I'm done here as well. People with IDD also experience the types of discrimination um, or other types of discrimination, um, particularly BIPOC persons and those with co-occurring disabilities like mental health, anxiety, um, 
addiction, they're even more impacted and further isolated um, from systems that could provide legal services to them. Um, we are asking for um, $1.04 million to prototype having a legal system, a legal team consisting of coordinators, legal um, assistants, attorneys, all working, especially, um, you know, they're specially trained to work with folks with IDD. They're going to reach out to individuals with IDD and their families. Um, Senator Shelley Short is sponsoring our bill, and we're hoping for lots of bipartisan support for this. Um, this legislative season, people with IDD and their families were queried about 13 quite likely legislative issues, and they asked survey takers um, if they supported them. Access to legal services was tied number one, along with housing um, uh, and designating funding support for housing. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can all work together to educate the community um, and our representatives that disability rights are human rights and about the importance of ensuring equity for all. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm going to be putting uh, the link to our study. Oh, Stacy's already done that. Thank you so much, Stacy. Um, I this would provide. I also should have mentioned um, this would be statewide. We sponsored the the study here in Spokane, but it was state studied statewide, and we would have representation on both the west and the east side um, of the state. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you did a great um, um, doing um, presenting the issue on that. Um, um, and yeah, this is why legal civil civil legal services are super crucial. And I'm so glad to see that um, um, coming up at this session and to see where it goes. Um, and just a gentle reminder, as for those who are speaking or talking, uh, just to try to slow it down a little bit as we have interpreters here. Um, and next up, we're gonna have Stacy Dim speak on truth and reconciliation, so. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is great uh, so far. What a great kickoff for Advocacy Days. And I just wanna say a shout out again to Kathy uh, for joining us this year and coming in behind Diana and to our two hosts again, Tanika and Taylor. We couldn't do it without you guys. Um, so this bill, uh, what I think will be a bill um, that's going to address preservation of records at our state RHCs, our residential habilitation centers. Um, we'll get at this issue of how we tell our historical treatment, the story of our historical treatment of people with developmental disabilities in our state. Um, many of you know that our state institutions have been open since the 1890s, that they hold a great deal of historical information about how we cared for or didn't care for people with developmental disabilities in our state's care under government policy. Um, we all know that um, in many very legal ways, we do not treat people with developmental disabilities respectfully. Um, and that in some cases there was abuse and neglect. There have been some attempts to tell the story of Washington State's history of the treatment of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities I mean, what we've discovered is that there are still a lot of really valuable and important records, uh, artifacts, film footage, um, and other uh, letters to superintendents, other kinds of documents that are still sort of just around at the state institutions. Um, they have not been sent to the state archives office and e even more so they haven't been digitized so that people can get access to that information. Um, since working on this particular issue, I've become aware of many families who are seeking out information about their grandmothers and aunts and uncles uh, who may have passed away. Um, we know that at Lakeland Village in particular, there are um, several hundred unmarked graves of people there. They don't have gravestones. Um, so we've been working hard to see if there's a way that we can get collaboration between the state RHCs, the state archives office, and um, a research group at the University of Washington to collect the records, digitize the records, and then be able to take that information and tell the story. So I know that we're expecting a proviso on the House and the Senate side, at least, to begin this work. 
I think that Repre uh, Senator Kaufman will be um, potentially dropping a bill. I've seen a draft, and so we're watching carefully to see if that drops in the next little bit. And I hope that we'll all support this effort so that we can make sure that none of that information and none of those stories are lost because all of those stories are valuable and important. Thank you. All right. Stacy, thank you so much for sharing that. I think we want to hop in the chat here. We've been going so quick. We've been neglecting you in the chat. So let's go back a little bit. I see a, a lot of praise in the chat um, for our speakers. So please check the chat. A lot of support um, for all of you. I see a, a lot of people who are new here who want to know how they can give, be more involved. Uh, with advocacy, we're going to have a little bit of time um, towards the end of the program today that's going to um, talk about what you can do, how you can be involved, um, coming from Sean Latham at SAIL. So hold on, we'll give you some ways you can be active and um, active here and uh, advocate, because that's the point of why we're here, right? To do advocacy. Um, and I think that's it. If I If I missed anything, please let me know. We're trying to get that chat. It's going pretty quick. Taylor, if you see anything, <laughs> please um, let me know. I know it, it looks like we're a uh, we may be a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so if anybody has any questions or comments, we could probably like answer or address a few. If there's anybody that um, has anything they want to say. Hi, Ra Hi Ramona. Hi, if there was a question in the chat or a request, uh, just some clarification. Do we know, will the legal studies pilot, are we expecting a bill or should we just look for a proviso? If the Argus Bocan uh, isn't oh. able to answer oh, that question, then I'm happy to <laughs> <laughs> jump in. Go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, uh, yes, um, but please fill in. Um, you know, we, we've we had um, lots of people working on this. It's really important. Um, it will be a bill. Um, I think it's sponsored by uh, Senator Short, for sure. But um, I know our advocate here, Kate, is also working um, to see if we can get lots of, lots of more, lots more support. Stacy, Phil, please jump in. Yeah, and I know um, it's, it's important for everybody to understand uh, we change things sometimes through a bill, which takes a lot of um, community input and a series of hearings. And then sometimes we can get what's called a budget proviso, which is just usually a paragraph in the budget with an assigned amount of money for a smaller project or something that um, doesn't really need that much vetting from the public. Um, and I have heard from both the House and the Senate that um, folks are very interested in a proviso that would set up the pilot project um, described in the Arcus Bocan's research paper. So one way or another, I think we'll either see a bill or we'll see a proviso. All right, do we have any other questions? Nothing about us without us, anything on the legal? I see Michelle. Michelle Whitehead, go ahead. Hi, I have a question about the um, the study that was done in Spokane. Nowhere to turn. Was that just um, was that data gathered in the Spokane area, or was that data gathered statewide, or where did they get the data for that study? I'm just curious. The study was statewide. Um, we actually um, we received funding to have Stacy Seabrecht um, conduct a civil civil uh, legal services feasibility study, and it was very intense. She in interviewed many, many, many self-advocates and families um, and just found the huge need that she outlines really beautifully um, in in the linked. Um, it's kind of, it's very readable. Um, there are some, there's some plain language uh, in, in some of the documents that we have that explains the, the huge need. It is statewide and the study would also, um, or the pilot would cover the whole state. We would want something in Spokane and something of course um, on the west side of the state, um, uh, hoping to just get the civil rights of folks with IDD and their families um, uh, met. 
I see Carrie's hand. I'm Carrie Cunningham Roswick, and I'm a member of the Northwest Road Disease Coalition and also a proud parent of a young adult daughter with an intellectual disability. And I'm very excited about nothing about us without us. I know it's been out there in the legislature. This is not the first year, but I recently had a big light bulb turn on. And we're talking about individuals that live with disabilities having civil rights. And my thought goes to parents and caregivers. I am a very loving parent and active in the advocacy world. And it just came to me how much I have taken my daughter's civil rights away. I am still her mom no matter what happens. However, I have held her back. And I learned this because she was no longer living with us. She was living with people whose orientation was, this is an adult, this is what she can, this, these are the opportunities. So my thought is, in addition to, in, in addition to educating and informing legislators and policymakers, those of us in the community can actually be spokespeople for parents and caregivers. And because it can be scary to let go. And I think that we then can turn into advocates for the rights of those that we love. And that's that's kind of my thought. And that's based on my realization recently that I can do I can do less, <laughs> not more, but I can do less for her. And then she can grow on, you know, with the support she has. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that great story, Carrie. That's what it's about. It's about sharing our stories and being advocates in this community. So thank you so much for sharing your voice. Uh, excuse me, I'll just interject. I love what you said there. And that's what's all about with the Nothing Without Us. For years that we have not had a chance to put our, our voice, even though, yes, we had silently put our voices in, but when it came to this task force, the way I learned about it was the um, one time when they started with the Ruckel House bill, which is saying, that just before that, it was like, oh, they claimed that they had somebody on that committee that had two people that had disabilities. And so, and that, and so why are we so, even though we are speaking up, why isn't those things getting reciprocated back? So this way it just says, okay, we need to be able to be there on these things to state, we need to be there. So that we can be able to say, hey, why does it does not affect us? If it affects us in any way, we need to be there. And that's what truly I believe in what this bill does. It's nothing without us, without us bill. And it stipulates, it says, unless you're already doing it, let's keep doing it and keep, keep moving on. I know King County, a lot of organizations still somewhat do it, but this helps further that idea and that concept to make sure that if you have lived experience or you're there, it doesn't matter what part of the state you are, that you have that vote, the person has that voice, especially the person with a disability has that voice to be able to make. And if you don't have it very well, who can you get support from to make sure that your voice is still heard? No, that's my true belief with that. And thank you. And all those stuff today has been great. Nice to see everybody. Elephair. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, it's nice to see everybody. I like Kyle and uh, Carrie do. And uh, I'm sorry, whoever else said that uh, we need to give support and tell the community and everybody you're around about that nothing without us bill because that's about us and our family. We should be at the table whenever any legislation is made. Um, I also am a big advocate or <laughs> for um, aging parents who have adult loved ones in the home. And I so appreciate caring other parents who are able to, whose 
able to navigate away for their child to have an apartment and so forth. I'm, uh, I, I don't know where I, well, I do know where I stand on that, but I'm also wondering um, what kind of plans are there for people like myself who want to have um, care more hours or support or caregivers with my son, but like in an apartment or ADU or something like that next to the house. I haven't, I, I, that's what I'm working on. And I would like to know more about that. Um, also, when we, the last thing I want to say is when we had our legislature, legislative forum at the Doubletree <laughs> for the first time since COVID, I talked with, I think her name is Claudia Kaufman about proposing that our, we talk to legislators about um, having caregiver coursework introduced to universities and colleges so that there's a continuum, continuum of care for our loved one. In other words, the, we know what we do, but you can learn this trade and it'll be a more respected trade because you can take college courses for it or get your associate's degree or whatever. Then you go to the next level and the next level. And why am I saying that? Because I have can count the times I've taken my son to the doctor or he's been hospitalized, and uh, which hasn't been recent in years. But uh, people say, well, okay, I'll ask, can a caregiver come here? Well, what does that mean? I said, well, so they can know what to do with my son when he gets out of the hospital. And also, so that maybe they can come and check up on him. And I can count the times that it, it, that's been a conversation that they're just surprised to hear, I guess. Not so much my doctor. Uh, sometimes, depending on the doctor, but in the hospitals and other places, it seems like, you know, medical, the nurses and doctors do one thing, caregivers do another thing. In my opinion, as a retired special ed education teacher, it flows from the time that child is born all the way up to adulthood to the, um, what is it, the 18, uh, I guess, I forget what it's called, when they're after eight, past 18, transition program. That and into adulthood, these things don't have like, okay, this is, uh, you know, child, this is babyhood, this is childhood and education. Now we're into high school. It's a continuum. And people need to be aware of all of these things so that our loved ones can get the best care because they're aware. Oh, we can do this. We can do that. We have options. We can go here. We can take them there. If you want residential, we have that. But if you want to stay in the home, they can do this. And they can go into the community like if they can't work. I mean, there should be options. And people, more people than us need to know about it, and especially our legislators making all these laws. Thank you. Thank you, Elifair. We're gonna, I'm gonna let Diana uh, chime in real quick. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna have Kathy uh, go over the bu bills and budgets. But thank you so much for sharing, Elifair. You're welcome. I don't know how to lower my hand. How do I lower my hand? Good morning. Um, I just wanna remind people what advocacy is. We're working on the Nothing About Us Without Us bill, and that's been work on for several years now. And it is so important because if the legislature creates a work group or a stakeholders group, we want our voices on there. But that's not the be all end of all of it because many policies and budget items never have a work group or a stakeholder group first. They just get introduced into a session, they get committee hearings, and they get passed or die in the legislature. So it's not only on the work groups that your voice needs to be heard, but it's every day on the bills and budgets that the legislators are addressing in each of their committee hearings. So make sure to remember that's a place for your voice to be heard as well. And Taylor, if it's okay, I just uh, direct Elifair to the chat. Elifair, I put a link in the chat for a project that might help you start thinking about the questions that you are asking all of us as a group, because we're all here to help everybody. I want to make sure 
that you get the support that you need. Thanks. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Diana. All right, Kathy, uh, do you wanna go over the bills and budgets? Yes, so there's a lot happening this session. We are, there's lots of things going on. There's lots of things to share. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, now let's see if I can find the right spot. So it's just a second here. First of all, I wanna show you where you can find some stuff on the Ark of Washington's website that may be helpful for you. So if you go to, um, and somebody can put this link into the chat box, I believe. If you go to our website, to our main page, and you go to advocacy, then you can go to Bill Tracker. You'll come right here. And there are three things today that are there for you. There's the governor's budget proposal. There are bills of interests, and there are hearings of interests for the rest of this week. So, and so I'm going to start with the budget proposal just to look at. This is the the governor's budget is the um, kind of the starting place for budgeting for this year. So he puts that out there, and frankly, then the House and the Senate write their own budgets. <laughs> But it may send some signals to them about what was important to him. So it's really a starting place. And um, here we go. Are you, are, is everybody still seeing that? The, the governor's budget, perfect. So there's some things on here and we haven't, we haven't put up or down on any of this. We're just putting it out there. Um, there's some things for, to reduce, case management caseload. So, you know, you know how our case managers are super busy. Um, this would allow them to have a smaller caseload and hopefully give us a little more quality care. So there's some funding for that. Um, we're really excited because there's some money, he put some money in for parent to parent and for informing families, which we think is kind of one of those foundational things for families. You know, when you just get that kiddo with a new diagnosis, where do families go and they need support? So this would give us some, some more funding to be able to make that bigger and also to give us really good information around um, in, from informing families. Um, there's there's some weird stuff, a small amount of money for some relocation costs for some facilities. There is some money to replace a dock at Lakeland Village. <laughs> to, to apparently make it safe and um, ADA compliant. Um, again, there's some other money around the caseload related to that. Um, there's some other things in here, um, some recertification. I think the other things that are probably most important to you, there's some money around ESIT, early support for infants and toddlers to make a, a technical adjustment. Apparently, the agencies weren't getting paid for the first month that of service, which is kind of an intense month because that's when they do all the evaluations and such. So this is for a fix for that. Um, there's some estimated caseload for foster children. There is paraeducator money, which is really good. Um, there is some other increase for the special education cap. Um, and there's some other smaller, smaller things in the capital budget, which is the, you know, that's the budget where they're building physical things. <laughs> there is money for, there was four and a half million for the housing trust to fund DD set aside, which we're very happy about. Um, there was some money for open doors, multicultural families for their housing village that includes people with IDD. Um, there, there's some money to replace Rainier School laundry machines, however we feel about that. So um, anyway, this is just kind of a rundown what it is. And you can go as the session progresses, we'll see when the House and the Senate put out their budgets, we're gonna compare them and you'll be able to come here and see how those things look. And there'll probably be new things on here that 
the House and the Senate put in that aren't in the governor's budget. So we'll see how that all goes. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. Now make sure that this works. Are y'all back to the bill tracker now? Do you see the bill tracker? Okay. Let's look at bills excuse, of interest. Excuse me, Kathy, I have one question. There was money sure. that they put in for a dock repair at Lakeland. Why doesn't yep. he return it to our, the community and put it for um, upgrades or whatever that necessary in the community and rather than putting it in institutions when a lot of us are dead set against putting any money because of the fact yeah. that are that are going that direction because it seems like every year that they always put money in for something that helps makes the building safe and or upgrades when they can put that money toward the community for more updates and support people with disabilities in the community that's a really good question, Kyle, that I don't have the answer for. I think <laughs> those would be really good questions to ask your legislators and what they think about that and um, you know what how how they might mitigate that in their own budgets. So that's good. Thank you. Okay, back to the bill tracker. So let's look at the bills of interest for this week. There's been a lot of bills that have been coming. And let me make this bigger so y'all can see better. I think that's good. And I've got to make this smaller so I can see the sh sheet too. Okay, so these first top things are about the budgets. So th these are the governor's budgets that you're gonna see that you saw happen already, then those numbers. Something else that's important to understand is this session is a supplemental session. We call it a short session. So mostly what they're coming to do is to tweak the big budget that they made last year and make adjustments. Um, it's been interesting the past couple of years during COVID, there was a lot of extra money that came um, from COVID relief that was, and we got a lot of big increases in funding for some important programs. What the governor signaled to us was that that time is over. <laughs> And we need to get back to being um, just tweaking the supplemental budget and not making it, um, you know, just some policy changes and so forth. So what you saw reflected in the governor's budget was not a lot of really big ticket items um, and big new programs and such. Um, now, the public, you might be reading in the news, they say there's a lot of money, and that's true in the budget, but a lot of it has been designated for specific things already, and it's been designated for maintenance kinds of things, just to maintain the caseload, like more people are on the program, so that requires more money to maintain them. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, here, So those are the budget bills. Um, also about this chart, this chart tells you that the number of the bill, you can go over here and click on it. It'll take you right to a bill. Maybe we'll do that in a minute and look at that. Um, the title of the bill, a little bit about the bill, who sponsored it, which committee it's in, and if the status of it. So over here, you see PH19 at four o'clock. That means that there was a public hearing on that bill yesterday at four. And then um, over here, you're going to see the position of the bill. So, and this bill, this chart is specifically from the ARC of Washington. Understand that this is a bill tracker. It's not all our, pri it's not a priority list of things. It's a tracker. These are the bills that the ARC of Washington is tracking. Um, this little sign means that we're under review, we're thinking about things. Um, sometimes we, we have some agreement and we're positive. Sometimes we're gonna see, you're gonna see a thumbs down on things too. There's a lot of under review this time because we're still learning about, it's early in the session and we're still doing a lot of learning about what's happening. Um, okay, so here are some of the bills for this week um, that have come up. So there is a bill that 
um, it, this is, comes from ALTSA, I believe, that standardize, it's about clarifying employment standards for long-term care workers, that's the IPs. Um, it's just making some technical adjustments. Um, I don't think there's anything that we would object to there. Um, this next one, you'll remember, maybe some of you may remember that last year, they added some additional people that could be family uh, in the term around individual provider. Um, so they, it's like, we would continue consider you to be family. Well, apparently they missed some categories and I can't remember which ones they missed, but they're adding a couple more categories into who's considered family. It might be something like a daughter-in-law or something like that, um, of people who are caring. And what that does is it just means if you're in the family category, you don't have to do quite as much training. Um, and that means that then we can get people turned around quicker and, um, support in there faster for folks. So it's just a technical fix from last year. Um, there's a bill here, the rights of residents in long-term care facilities. Um, there was some concerns um, about um, people that, um, how they were being discharged. And so that bill was there. That bill, This bill also has some other things in it that kind of take the nursing home standards and puts them on adult family homes and assisted living. So, so there's some mixed things. Um, so that we may see some changes happening in this bill to make it work. So that's why it's definitely under review. There's kind of pluses and minuses and hopefully they'll work those issues out. Um, I don't know a lot about this one. This is about inpatient behavioral health support for young adults supporting young adults following inpatient um, care. Um, there's a bill, um, this is a, a really big bill about paying parents of minor children with developmental disabilities. And you, currently parents of individuals who are over the age of 18, the parents can be the paid provider. But if they're under the age of 18, they cannot be paid to do that. And this bill would allow for parents to become the paid provider for minor children. And you'll see here today, um, it's in House Human Services, and there's a hearing this afternoon on this bill. So you may want to check that out. Um, there's also a bill, this bill just dropped and we're just reading it. There's a bill, it increases access to, to respite by, it would allow, you know, um, on our basic plus waiver, there is a uh, list of services called aggregate services that you can use. And then respite is a separate category what they're suggesting in this particular bill is allowing, um, you would still have the category, the separate category for respite, but it would add respite to the aggregate services. So you could use all the, the set aside respite, plus you could use what was that you're funding from the aggregate service toward respite. So it's a fairly simple bill. I don't think it really changes too much, except it may allow somebody to have more respite if they're not using that aggregate service for anything else. Um, there is a bill. Kathy, this is Margaret Lee. Can you tell me what number that is? I can't read the numbers. Okay. Pain parents of minor, uh, yes. increased respite. So increased teen respite is 6126. Thank you. Yeah. And then this bill is um, Representative Farivar that was here with us this morning has just put out. This bill is the DD Medicaid waiver prioritization. What it would do is direct, it, it would codify, it would make it law that who um, would have priority to get waivers. And the things that they talked about were people who are in hospitals, people coming out of RHCs and in crisis. And also it would prioritize senior families, which we think is really important. 
And sometimes, you know, they they haven't spent a lot of time prioritizing senior families in the last few years. So we think that that's a really good thing. So that bill just came out. Um, there's a new bill we just learned about, 2221, about access. There's a work group about establishing a ASL, American Sign Language um, Interpreter Work Group which sounds like a good thing, access to interpreters. Um, there's, I think this one, the Crisis Relief Center bill, this is a, a fix from last year, then all it does is it adds minor children to, that could have access to crisis relief centers. There's also a bill that um, 2080, day habilitation that would establish day habilitations for services for people with developmental disabilities. So this would add a new service category outside onto the waivers that would be for what is called day habilitation. Um, and it would provide um, 20 hours a week of day services for individuals with IDD. Um, you can go and read the bill here. And you could, um, today there's a hearing at 1.30 p.m. And you could sign up there to do that. Um, education. So there's a bunch of education bills and I'm actually gonna call on Ramona Hattendorf who knows these bills way better than I do. <laughs> Is she there and does she wanna unmute? I am, I was just, I was putting in sign in things. I was about to put in the isolation sign in. I'll follow okay. up with that one. All right. So the good news is that for years, special education and students with disabilities never had any bills. Um, they didn't have any budget um, increases. In the last couple of years, we've had a lot of interest. So, um, so here we go. Uh, 5883, burden of proof. There's also a companion bill, 2121. For those of you who don't know, often they will introduce a bill in one chamber and they'll introduce the identical bill in the other chamber. Um, and either one of these may be amended so they can end up being different bills. But right now there's companion bills and they're the same. This one would shift the burden of proof in special education due process hearings. Right now, families, have the burden of proof to uh, prove that the school isn't isn't fulfilling the IP or um, made a mistake or something along those lines. And this would switch it so that the school districts have to be able to show that the, the IEP or the special education services decision was the correct one. Uh, the one um, asterisk with that is that in cases where families are seeking tuition reimbursement for what's called a unilateral parent placement, then they have to still show burden of proof. So parents can't just automatically say, I'm going to um, place my child in a private school and you have to pay for it. There is a higher bar in that legal proceeding, but for the other ones, it would shift to the, shift to the um, school district. Uh, Kathy already mentioned funding for infants and toddlers. That's specifically for the early supports um, and making sure that this is a technical fix. There's discussion about it being amended to get a little bit more funding in there. Um, but we'll see how that one progresses. Uh, the prototypical school staffing model, that's 5882. It's also 1960. And that one is specifically about more money for more money for paraeducators. Um, if you don't know the way the state funds schools is they have uh, like this, the, the, the typical school, the prototypical school will be this size. And we want to make sure that you know this many positions are funded. And so they figure all this out and they send that much money to the school districts, but then the school districts can actually decide how they want to spend it. So they will get more money for paraeducators, but then it's on the local level to make sure that they're actually still putting that money into the paraeducators. There's a few bills on increasing the special education cap. Um, the easiest one, <laughs> To understand are the first ones men men mentioned by 882. I'm sorry, that's school staffing. Um, 6014 and 2180. And that one is just simply increasing it to 17.25. Right now it's at 15. 
does not lift it, doesn't promise to do anything in the future. It just says, you know, starting next year, we'll go up to 17.25. And that's also what the governor asked for in um, his budget proposal. Um, but then there's more. There's more suggestions on what to do with the cap. Uh, the 2174, that one would get rid of the cap entirely, but then it would add a new process. So school districts that were above the 15% cap uh, would essentially have to uh, uh, build a state, uh, lay, lay out like, um, this is this is how much more funding that we need. Uh, this is how we're going to spend it. This is how we've identi identified the students. Um, they also need to do a breakout of the different types of disabilities, um, whether those disabilities uh, uh, relate to prevalence in the community. So there's there's you're lifting the cap, but you're also asking school districts to provide a lot more information about money above and beyond the 15%. So there's still kind of a an extra bar or extra hoop that they would have to jump through. And then you have another one, uh, 2175. This one just removes the cap, simple, no cap. No extra hoops to jump through, uh, no cap. And then there's more, 1479. Uh, oh, no, wait a second. I'm sorry, that's ending isolation. So I think that's on the cap. And if you don't know, School districts by law have to serve every student who's eligible for special education services, but our state only pays for up to 15% of the student population. So sometimes school districts might have 10% of their students uh, use special education services and they would get a per student allocation for all 10%. But some school districts have 18, 19, 20%, and they don't get that much money. They only get enough for 15%, and so they have to spend their money more thinly. They have to spread it. They have more people um, asking for the same amount of money. So that's the stress there that they're trying to talk about. Restraint and isolation, There, are, there's two different uh, strategies that were introduced. One, uh, 1479, and there was a companion last year that never got a hearing, um, 5559. 1479 passed out of the House last session, did not pass out of the Senate. It's back in the House. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a two-day work session. There was one on Monday, and then there was another one um, last evening. Um, I would really recommend uh, watching or learning um, from the work sessions. There will be a hearing on this bill tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I'll add in how you can sign in. This bill would phase out the use of isolation and it would restrict chemical and mechanical restraints. So it would further restrict restraints and it would get rid of isolation. And there's different proposals. The original bill just wanted to get rid of it. There were amendments where they wanted to phase it out, starting with the youngest children. Um, but right now, children preschool age all the way through uh, 12th grade can be isolated legally. Um, and it's it's a practice that there is no therapeutic value in it. Um, it's, it's actually psychologically harmful. It's used mostly, 80% um, of the instances are with preschool age children or children in the elementary school years. It's disproportionately used on black children and 90% of instances involve um, children with disabilities. So, and then within the group, very overrepresented are children who are homeless and children in the foster care system. So these bills are really looking at children who are experiencing trauma and how does the school system respond to them in a, in a safe and therapeutic and trauma informed way. There was another restraint and isolation bill introduced this session, and that is 5966. It's important to note the main difference is that does not get rid of isolation. It keeps isolation. Um, it would get rid of the me mechanical and chemical restraints. And both those bills also have uh, guidelines on how instances would be reported and follow up and, and things along those lines. Uh, 1914, improving the education of students. 
this one, let me go to my notes here. All right, so this one, some of you might be interested in. I, I, I suggested to Kathy that we keep a, an under review um, just because I'm very interested in hearing the testimony on how that comes out and if there's any concerns. But this would require a few things. Um, school districts would have to give parents information about the Office of the Education of Ombuds with any special education materials. And that's an excellent resource um, for parents um, to understand what the law is and what their rights are. Um, so, that, so that's one aspect. Um, districts would also have to provide parents with a monthly report about the quantity and the method of special education services delivered to their students. So I know there is something in the chat. I don't know that if this would resolve that concern, but sometimes parents are, they aren't really sure what's going on. And so this would provide a little bit of clarity and accountability um, to parents about what the services are and how they're being delivered. Um, it would also um, ask um, educational service districts. Those are like regional hubs that uh, provide services to the school districts. Uh, it would ask them to contract for different professional services. This is the part of the bill I'm not real sure about. I think mainly they want to make sure that some of your smaller school districts um, have access to therapists. Um, your larger school districts can hire people directly on staff, but that's not something that all school districts can do. So that's part of the bill that I personally um, want to learn a little bit more about, like what would that look like? Um, it also, it would change the burden of proof similar to the other bills that were just about burden of proof. It would switch it so that um, it would be on the school districts to be able to demonstrate that yes, um, the IEP decision was correct and they would have to defend that. And then it would change, it would change a law about something called special education ombuds. Last session, there was a funding bill that was passed and that's where they, they raised the cap um, a little bit and they added some more funding for education. And then that bill, they said, we want to have special education ombuds at all the different educational service districts. And that person could help work with families around um, some conflict related to special education, but they didn't actually fund it. And this bill would take that okay. out entirely. So we're not going to do that, which is disappointing. But this is this has come up a few times in bills where they want to have some sort of um, an advocate for parents specific to special education, but then they look at how expensive it would be, and they they typically then end up pulling it out. So that unfortunately would take out that, but it would add in information about how to contact the education ombuds, and then. The, ad, where are we? We are at adjusting special education enrollment, 1923. Uh, that would exempt some school districts from the cap. Um, essentially your school district's really small, like 2,500. It also um, increases the cap to 16% in stages. And it requires the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, that's the state agency for K-12 schools, to review any over identifying and over providing. And then extending special education services. Uh, this is something to align. Some people feel that this would better align state law with federal law or a federal practice. Maybe national aid practice is a better way of putting it. Right now, if you are a student, the year you turn 21, um, that would be your last school year that you would be eligible for services. Most, most students receiving special education services do not continue on to age 21, but some do. This would extend that to the school year in which you, are, you, you turn age 22. And um, advocates who support this um, feel that this better aligns with the intent and what other states are doing. And I haven't looked at the chat, so I don't know if we have any questions that we need to follow up with. There is some questions, but how are we doing on time? Because I know Sean still has to go and yeah. Yeah. How about we come back to those? Okay. Um, just a few of the other bills. There's a bill about service animal training. Um, 
that you might want to take with we're, we're not so sure about it because I think it may leave um if some, your service animal does some damage or some such you may be responsible for it so I think we're still un, under revert view and we probably need to check on that and learn more about that um we we always pay attention to guardianship bills but we, this seems to be just a technical assistance technical uh fix bill because right now um it you can't start the guardianship process till the person actually turns 18 where so and then there's about six weeks or so to get it started that this would just allow you to start the process so that it will be done at age 18. So it's just, a, it's a fix for the bill. Um, there's a bill about voter education we're not too sure about. Just pay attention there. Um, we've seen it come through our, a lot of people are sending it to us, so we're, we need to review it some more. There's a, this is just an interesting bill. It's assistance improvement bill that says developing a resource data tool to connect Washington residents to services and resources. And we all the, the thing that we thought about was, hmm, I wonder if that includes pe DDA and people with disabilities. So just pay attention if that's of interest to you. Um, in the future, there's going to be some proviso requests, people requesting things in proviso. I believe CEA is going to be asking for a rate increase for employment and community inclusion. And CRSA is going to be asking for 10% rate increase for supported livings. We don't know who's gonna be sponsoring those things, but just know that those are on the radar. Um, there's there's some other bills that we're hearing about that may be coming up, but I think I need to end now so that Sean can talk about how to be involved. Uh, this is how be involved. This is Sean Latham, and this year I'm representing self-advocates in leadership as their new policy coordinator. I want to thank everyone for taking your time out today to join us for Advocacy Day. We want to encourage you to contact your legislators throughout session, but especially this week, about the issues that matter to you. You can contact your legislators through different methods. You can email them and their legislative assistant about your priorities. You can contact them through the legislative hotline phone number and ask to leave a message for them. I will put the number into the chat. We also encourage you to request either an in-person meeting with them or a meeting over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Please reach out to the legislative assistant of the legislator to request a meeting. You can watch the legislature at work on TVW, either on your TV, if you have the channel, or online at tvw.org. Another way you can participate is by signing up to testify at legislative hearings. For each hearing, you can sign up for the individual bills as pro, meaning you are for the bill, con, meaning you are against the bill, or other if you have concerns with the bill you generally like. This week have several issues in the hearings we want you to think about and advocate about. Since this is the Civil Rights Advocacy Day, I know you would agree with the following statement. People with disabilities desire to live, work, learn and play in their community, requiring accommodations to get what they need to live their lives. Federal civil rights laws are there to make sure that people with disabilities are not denied services, provided unequal treatment or relegated to segregated settings and to ensure they have equal opportunities to benefit from state services and programs. Now again, the issues we are following today for civil rights are, one, shifting the burden of proof in special education. Two, ending harmful use of restraint and isolation in schools and instead use better de-escalation techniques. 
Three, ensuring behavioral health services are accessible to people with different types of disabilities so individuals don't end up in institutions or stuck in the hospital. Four, Including individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities are involved in the system's advocacy process through the Nothing About Us Without Us Act. 5. Providing legal aid so people with disabilities can access their rights. And finally, 6. Making sure the legislature and DDA preserve the records of records of Lakeland Village what we call truth and reconciliation. Because it's important to always have the records of the past so we can do better in the future. For more information about these and other issues, I'm going to post this week's one pager in the chat. Also again, please see the ARC spills of interests. For additional information. Mm -hmm. Second, let's talk about the hearings coming up today and the rest of the week. Today at 1.30 in the House Health Care and Wellness Committee. House Bill 1969, a bill to expand the definition of family member for individual providers will be heard. Also at 1.30 today at the House Human Services, Youth and Early Learning Committee, two bills will be heard related to us. House Bill 1929, Supporting Young Adults Following Inpatient Behavioral Health Treatment. And House Bill 2080, Establishing Rehabilitation Services for Persons with Developmental Disabilities. A 4 p.m., the House Appropriations Committee will be continuing their public meeting on the Governor's Budget Proposal. This is House Bill 2104. Tomorrow there is a huge amount of hearings, so I am just going to highlight a few and then refer you to Kathy's full hearing schedule document. At 8 a.m. the House Education Committee will be looking at House Bill 1479 concerning restraint or isolation of students in public schools and educational programs. They will also be looking at House Bill 1914, improving the education of students with varying abilities by enhancing special education services. At 1.30, the House Capital Budget Committee will be looking at Governor's Capital Budget proposals and then at for the Senate Ways and Means Committee will also be looking at those proposals. And then to highlight one on Friday, at 1.30, the House Labor and Workplace Standards Committee will be looking at House Bill 1942, clarifying employment standards for long-term care individual providers. All of these right now that I mention are public hearings that you, and I mean you, can sign up to testify at. Mm. Mm. Let me now take you through the process of testifying using the Washington State Legislative website that can be found at leg.wa.gov. On the website under the section, let your voice be heard. Click on the button that has participate in the committee hearing on it. From there under the participating in a community hearing section, Click on Testifying in a Committee Hearing. Next, choose if you testifying in a Senate hearing or House hearing. Today, I will choose to testify on House Bill 2880, the Bill on Dehabilitation Services. So I will choose the House option. After this, I will select the committee I need to testify on. In my case, it's the Human Services, Youth and Early Learning Committee. I must then choose what meeting for the committee I want to testify at by selecting the red date and time of the desired meeting. In this case, it would be the meeting on the 10th at 1.30.
I will then choose the bill 2080. Now after this for all hearings, I need to choose the way I want to testify. We all have the choice to testify in person, testify by video remotely, or we can submit written testimony or just state what our position is on the bill. After you pick one of the options, you will be taken to the form to register. You will need to fill out your position, your name, your email, your address, your phone number, and your organization if you are representing one. It also asks you if you will testify on a panel or not. If you are testifying on a panel, it will ask you the names of the other panelists. The other box to make note of is the pronunciation box. If you want your name said right, you can sound it out in that box. Please also check the box. I'm not a robot at the end of the form, and then it's time to hit submit registration. Once you submit your registration, you will receive an email from a committee staff email address. Please read this email carefully and add the meeting to your desired calendar using the links in the email. From there, make sure you are ready to testify. If you want to know more about the process or you need help to sign up, please reach out to me or Kathy. And please remember, change is made by those who show up and take action. So go take action, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. What a great way to wrap that up there. Thank you so much. I see we have one question. Margaret, did you have a question real quick? I do. It's real quick. Oh, it's um, a question. Sorry. <laughs> oh, um, go ahead, Margaret. Okay. Um, I would like the bills of this week, the one you dealt with today, I would like to print that out. And the only one I can find online is January 8th. And you, there were quite a few changes from the 8th to the 10th. Do you have the January 10th week bills of interest? So, Margaret Lee, the bills, the bills that were that are online today were updated last night. That's yeah. just for the this the eighth is the fir first day of the week. I know that, but can we get the, the 10th? It was it was updated on the tenth. On okay, well, I just went to the website, and the the one that's on the website is the same one I got Monday. Yeah, it should have been updated on the website. I'll I'll make sure I'll double check, but I'm pretty sure the one I updated it last night. Okay, the new you do that. Bills. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then also, everyone, please see the chat. Sean did put in um, the hearings for the week. Um, we we I mean, no, we just gave you a whole bunch of information. So please check that chat and download. And um, Sean has his contact info if you would like to reach out to him after this. And um, you should have Kathy's email um, as well. She's usually the one that sends us the links to get in. Um, but if not, I'm sure she has uh, put her contact info in there as well. And we have a whole bunch of links for you. Um, so please check that chat and down, if you can, save the chat for the day. That'll be very helpful. You can go back and um, go over all of this later. And I thought I saw a couple more hands. Did that answer folks' questions they had? Taylor, did you have something you? I thought I saw um, you. No, I'm good. Uh, I, okay. yeah. I've, um... Um, I'm also, um, I agree with what Tanika says, save the chat if you're able. Um, this is also recorded if you have, uh, um, if you just need to go over some more information. Um, Ramona also put a lot of helpful info in the chat um, on which bills have hearings this week. And, uh, and then she also put up, uh, let me see real quick, uh, I'm just going to like a uh, weekly email session to track bills. And she put that um, kind of a link in the chat and you don't have to scroll far up. It's pretty up there, but yeah. Um, but otherwise, um, so it's 1133 right now. Um, 
So if, if it's okay with Kathy um, and everyone, um, I think we're gonna kind of conclude uh, today's first advocacy days today. Um, there is a uh, survey um, that I believe uh, you can go on the Ark of Washington to, um, just to, if you want to input on how we did today. Um, I'm not sure, if, uh, are you sharing that on the screen, Kathy, or do you just want me to just tell them to go to the website? Um, so if you'll take, if, if you can, I have the English survey. It may not work for self-advocates. There's two ways you can do the survey. You can click on the links. There's the Spanish survey and the English survey that are in the links. The, the English one, you know, it has the traditional smiley faces and such that may be easier to understand. But if you want to do it right now, there's just five quick questions. You can do it in this poll. So if you would just take a minute to do that, hit the poll numbers and we'll be done. All right, so we'll give folks a few minutes to fill that out if you can, please. And also, uh, Christy Childs put the English survey and Spanish survey in the chat. Thank you, mm -hmm. Christy. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Okay. All right, so again, Good thank job, you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to everyone for being here. For our first advocacy days and again uh, to reiterate what Sean said it starts with you right so we're here to advocate so please get out there and make your voices heard if they don't hear from us they won't hear from anyone and they won't know our issues um, just real quick today. like next oh, ahead, Wednesday next Wednesday is the rally at the the CSRA is putting on do you know what time it's going to be put on or next Wednesday because I'm going to be down there and just um, yes, a few it of us are going to be. It will be at noon, noon? next week. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so plan around it. Courtney, if you heard that, I hope you got that. <laughs> Is that on the yeah. steps? That's on the 17th next week. Yes, next, it's next on the Wednesday. Capitol steps. On the steps. Okay, Capitol steps at noon. Okay, but advocacy day will still be virtual. <laughs> Yeah, I thank, will be in Lacey that day. That. I will be in Lacey that day, so with my family, so at the same time. <laughs> and Mr. Okay, Sean thank Link, you. And Mr. Wednesday. Mr. Sean Langford, you did a wonderful job. Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you, Mike. And Tamika, nice to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for uh, being here. Uh you. This will be the last time. <laughs> Ivanova, you did a great job. Yes, you did. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. I know I love Thank you, speeches. I'll probably see some of you guys at the hearing later today at 1.30. <laughs> yep. Yes. 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 Yeah. See you then. Bye. And Bye. please come back. Join us next week. Yep. And the week after. And the week after if you